Church, it's good to be together in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Are you speaking blessing to one another? Are you speaking that in your life? What are you speaking these days? Are you speaking blessing upon one another, upon your families, upon your lives? Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, hey, it's, uh, it's good to be here. This morning we had a wonderful time with several law enforcement officers. We had a law enforcement uh, service this morning to appreciate and honor them at the 9 o'clock, and that was an awesome thing. <laughs> Especially in, in light of just what's happened in, in Buffalo just yesterday, a neighboring community. Uh, that really hits close to home, doesn't it? And uh, we've been praying just for that community, for all that have been impacted. What a tragic and terrible, terrible thing that was. Awful thing. You need to continue to lift them up in, in, in your prayers. And I'm certainly thankful for law enforcement uh, that uh, they're, 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 they're there. They're trying to, to be there. Um, and, and they're called upon in all, all times when we're sleeping, when we're eating, when we're doing life and all that kind of stuff. They're out there in the community trying to keep us safe. So that's a, that's a huge blessing. I um, just want to give a little bit of a, a service announcement. Tomorrow morning, I have the, the opportunity uh, to go to Israel. So I'm going to be doing that tomorrow. I'm excited about that. Um, I'm going with uh, Bishop Robert Stearns, Eagles Wings Ministry. And um, it's, a, it's just completely uh, a blessing uh, that, uh, that he's able to, 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 to bring us in that way. And uh, going with uh, several other pastors from around the nation. And so I just ask if you could hold us up in prayer. I'd appreciate that. Certainly feel free to follow along with us as well. Um, I'll be posting pictures. Love to, love to look at the, the next year and, and possibly bringing a, a group out there. So part of the reason for me going is to, to look into that a little bit more on some other things too. Uh, so if that's on your bucket list, uh, listen, you, you, your life gets changed when you, when you walk in the Holy Land. It just does. And so um, looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, please be praying for us. With that being said, we're going to talk today about the blessing in the wrestling. Now, I never quite understood professional wrestling before. You've got two guys with no pants on fighting to win a belt. How does that work exactly? I mean, come on, if they're going to win something, give them some pants for the love of God, right? But I guess, I guess there's plenty of people that kind of follow along in that scene and all of that. There's a big market for it. But today, we're going to take a look at a story in the Bible, the blessing and the wrestling. And I want you to look at Genesis chapter 32 with me, if you will. I'm going to start in verse 22. This is a story about Jacob. Now, Jacob, that same night, he arose and his wives, his two female servants, his 11 children, they crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip pocket or socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with, striven, striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. This man that Jacob fought here, that he wrestled with, we find at the end of this story, and him realizing that he saw the face of God, that it was God himself. This is a picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that Jake, Jacob duked it out with. So here we have Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, coming to a standstill in his life. Everything had caught up to him in this moment. All of his bluffs were being called in. All of his debts were being settled. It was time for him to face everything that he was running from in his life. His past, 
his broken relationships, all the decisions that he has made, all of the dysfunctions in his own heart, his own family. 70 to 80 percent of Americans believe that their families are dysfunctional. About 40 percent have experienced family estrangement. 34 percent of children today are living with an unmarried parent, which is up from 19 percent in 1980 and up from 9% in 1960. The reality is that all of us, every single one of us in this room have been touched by some form of dysfunction in our own families, our own upbringings in the families that we have right now. That problem, it's not new to you, it's not new to me. It started right at the beginning with Adam and Eve when sin came into the world. Who knows exactly how it came down, but maybe after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden for disregarding the word of God. Maybe it was just Adam, he didn't, he didn't want to talk about it. He just wanted to sweep everything under the rug and keep going. I pushed his wife out. Maybe Eve couldn't handle the rejection of her husband and started looking for her firstborn son Cain to fill kind of a void in her life. She wasn't a good wife or so she thought because of the rejection and and so she wanted to be a good mom and that's where she tried to find her identity from. But maybe Eve let, let Cain, as he grew up, get away with everything. She glossed over his anger and rather than disciplining him, she enabled him. She, because she craved doing a good job. She craved love, identity. Maybe Adam just stood by, never addressed the issues. Similarly to when he stood by when the, the serpent was handing Eve that, that fruit in the garden. Maybe all this led to Cain acting out in anger. Because when he didn't get what he wanted, he would make a scene. Maybe he deflected and blamed everybody else but himself. Maybe that's why his brother Abel ended up dead in a field by Cain's own hand because Cain couldn't live with his brother getting something that he didn't have. Oh, how quickly sin distorted the heart of humanity, how sin affected the relationships, how sin affected family. The first family walked in dysfunction and then everyone thereafter. Dysfunctional family a result of the fall. And that dysfunction has passed down from generation to generation to generation. Scandals, tension between siblings, parents, and rivalries, manipulation, control, blaming, uh, I mean, toxicity, emotional harm. I mean, you name it, not to mention you throw in alcoholism in there, control and divorce and lying, deception, sexual sin to compound it all. Does any of that sound like maybe the family that you came from? Don't raise your hand. And careful, because they could be sitting right next to you. But the funny thing is, especially in this day and age, we think nobody else is experiencing dysfunctions in their families. Because of seeing everything around us, you come to church, everybody's smiling bright, everybody's good. You look on social media, you know, we were talking about the family pictures, hashtag blessed family vacation, hashtag blessed sports activities, hashtag blessed date night, hashtag, I mean, we just, we throw it up there. We put our best on even when we're experiencing our worst. The truth is we all experience some level of dysfunction that has been passed down to us. And sometimes it feels like We're up against this uphill battle fighting for the blessing of God because these things have been passed down to us. They almost feel like unfair advantages in life. Because of this, we often choose not to take responsibility for our own unacceptable behaviors. Rather, we justify them. The good news is God's blessing can fix our brokenness. There's a blessing In the wrestling, and what's been passed to you doesn't have to be passed on by you. Can I get an amen? Jacob was always a guy who did what he needed so that he got what he wanted. Even at birth, Jacob was contending with his twin brother, Esau. Esau came out first, but but Jacob was grabbing onto his heel. He didn't want to let his brother win. 
Couldn't, could, he couldn't be the first. Jacob was like, nah. uh Jacob means heel grabber or supplanter. Someone who usurps or seizes what's not his. It's not a positive thing. From birth to wrestling with God, Jacob had a bit of an issue with grabbing to get in his life. He did the same thing with God in this wrestling ring. He wouldn't let go of God until he got what he wanted. But you can't manipulate God. No matter how hard you try, you might get his blessing, but you might get a disjointed hip as well. God loves you. You know what? God loves you so much that he's willing to discipline you in your life. That's a good thing. See, we, we often do not want the discipline of God in our lives. But God loves you so much that he's willing to be that dad who says, uh-uh. Says, no, nope, that's not it. Why? Because he's not going to let us act like spoiled brats in our lives. He's called us to be his sons and daughters. Sons and daughters who grow to be like our father. He disciplines the dysfunctions out of us. But it's really our, his love for us. On one end of the ring, Jacob. Here he is. Now all of his family, all of his workers, all of his possessions, they were on the other side of the Jabbok right now. The Jabbok is a tributary of the Jordan River. The word itself means to empty itself. This is the place where Jacob would empty himself of Jacob. It's here that he was all alone. Alone with his thoughts, alone with his regrets, alone with his anxieties. Esau, his older brother, was coming for him now. He was coming for Jacob. It's the night before. Jacob's mama, Rebecca, couldn't save him from Esau this time. His wives and kids couldn't, couldn't save him from Uncle Laban this time. None of his possessions and everything he worked so hard for can, couldn't buy him out of this. It's in this place that God steps into the wrestling ring with you. Jacob, for all of his life, was either running ahead of God or lagging behind him. In this place, in the Jabbok, Jacob would learn how to walk with God, but only after wrestling God. I have two sons. When they were younger, maybe they were three and four, we'd often go to the different trails around and go for a hike, and, you know, we just want to be outside and all that kind of stuff. But one of my sons, he had a tendency to just have one gear, and that gear is to go. And so we'd get there, and he would, he would go. I mean, he would just start running down the trail. No fear, just go for it, man. And my other son, he would often get a bit distracted, looking at stuff, kind of walking slower. He'd always kind of lag behind. We'd always have to be like, come on, come on up, you know, come on. And, and so after a little while, we changed hobbies. Because we had one up there, one back there, and it just didn't work, right? I mean, we were constantly like, where are we? You know, all that kind of stuff. For Jacob, his life was a combination of both of these, just like it is for yours and mine. See, in life, our, our eyes can sometimes want too much, or we try to go after things that aren't in our season of our lives, and we fall prey to the sin of presumption, which is running ahead of God. We try to get ahead of him. Because we, we want what we want. We go after what we want. And then we try to, try to fit God into what we want. We try to justify everything in, in that sense. Just like Jacob did when he kind of snookered his brother Esau out of his birthright. You remember that story? See, Jacob found an opportunity to take something from his older brother that didn't belong to him. All because he wanted the blessing of his brother's birthright. Sometimes in life we start running ahead of God, grasping and grabbing for stuff, for power, for influence, for money, for attention, for notice that God never intended to give us. And we strive for it though. Jacob was contending with his older brother. It's an example of, of, of someone who's trying to grab God's blessing 
in his own strength. God is a God who freely gives. You don't have to contend for that in your life. One of David's prayers in Psalm 19 is that God would keep him from presumptuous sins. That they would not have dominion over him. Sins like selfish ambition, jealousy, pride. Sins that just kind of crop up on us. Sins that that we were really good at kind of covering up and making everything look okay. But on the inside, man, it's there's presumptuous stuff in there. Trying to get ahead and trying to grab all that we can. But that's not the example that Jesus gives us. Jesus says in, in John 5.30, I can do nothing. Everybody say nothing. I can do nothing on my own. Do you have a revelation of that, church? Do you? Re- I mean, yeah. Oh, you know, we tell ourselves we can do stuff. We tell our stuff all the time. I could do. I could. I could do. I could do all these things. But then, then life hits you. I can do nothing on my own. It's only because I seek the Father's will. I, I, I do the Father's will. Jesus went on to say, Jesus teaches us not to live by our own wills, striving. Pushing forward our personal agendas, manipulating, controlling according to our own desires. I mean, that's dysfunctional. And, and many of us in families can, can experience some of those things. He teaches us not to presume that what we want is what God wants. That our will is automatically God's will. We've got a tendency to do that. We got a tendency to, to have our will going on and, and we're doing our thing and, and we want God to bless our will rather going after what God blesses. See, you can go after God's blessing in your life. There's nothing wrong with it. Actually, go for it. Green light on that. But a lot of times we want God to bless what we're doing rather than going after what he's blessing. God blesses those who honor him. He blesses humility. Not having to to have your own way all the time. He blesses selflessness, sacrifice. Not living a life that revolves around the self. God blesses integrity. Integrity. Which is living to do what's right even when it hurts you. The other sin that that Jacob fell into is the sin of procrastination. Anybody? That's lagging behind God. Jacob, he wasn't lazy. He, he, was, he was a hard worker, but he worked for himself, self alone. It was all about Jacob. And as Jacob was working and striving to set himself up, he was procrastinating on following God. He put off God. He said, One day I'll get to my relationship with, with the Lord. One day I'll take things a bit more seriously. One day I'll I'll start walking with God. One day I'll start serving Christ. One day I'll I'll get plugged into a life group. One day I'll I'll make church a priority. One day I'll I'll go through motion. One day I'll I'll stop drinking. One day I'll I'll spend more time with my family and my marriage. One day I'll make God more of a priority. We all have our one days. Put stuff off. But Jacob, he couldn't run any longer. That day was here and now, and he was standing face to face with God across the Jabbok, the place where he would empty himself of himself. And when we put off God in our lives and live for ourselves, there's a host of other things that we just just invite into our lives, whether we realize it or not. Disillusionment, cynicism. Discouragement, unbelief, self-justification. We start to entertain other things. Maybe lustful thinking. Maybe, maybe, maybe unrighteousness. Whatever it might be, I, I don't know. But, but the reality is, is, is we, 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 we start to allow those things to come into our hearts. And before you know it, you're somebody who you never wanted to be. When you're too busy doing your own thing, God's blessing is put on hold. We have a tendency to put off God's process and we silence God's voice, speaking to those areas of our hearts that need to be emptied out. 
God tells us our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all else. We have the tendency to justify our behaviors and our actions and our words. Until we become a version of ourselves that is less than God's best and less than what God blesses. 1987, Ted DiBiase was invited to the headquarters of what was then known as the WWF, or the World Wrestling Federation. Now, I'm not a big wrestling guy at all, like I already told you my thoughts on wrestling, all right? But Vince McMahon, the CEO of, of, of it, said, said to, to Ted DiBiase, I got something for you, knowing that he wanted to become a professional wrestler. And he said, there's been so many things that have been done, but this has never been done. And, and just based on what I've seen from you, your work, you can pull this off, you're articulate, you'd be perfect. DiBiase was excited. He says, what is it? McMahon said, here's the deal. You have, to get, you have to first sign a contract with me before I tell you what it is. And here's why. If I tell you and you don't sign, I've given away a great idea and I can't afford to do that. DiBiase understood and asked for some time. But not long afterwards, DiBiase accepted and that's when the world came to know him as the million dollar man. Anybody know that wrestler? We just saw who likes wrestling here. Uh, no, <laughs> but a character that was created to be hated, actually. A guy who was so wealthy that he used to, to buy power and influence. At least that was the story, the persona that he was going for. But in order for him to pull it off, McMahon wanted DiBiase to, to truly be filthy rich or at least play like he was. And so he became his character outside the ring, too. He became famous interviewing on The Tonight Show and Regis and Kathy Lee. Video games, action figures, limos and Learjets were his life. He said he became like a rock star. In his words, next town, next show, next show, next party. And you know that all the rock and roll lifestyle, drug, sex, rock and roll. But all of that comes with the cost. Your soul becomes weighed down and you lose yourself in the meantime. And it's not just by fame and fortune. You can lose yourself in the midst of life in many other ways too. When you're putting off God's blessing. But during this time, DiBiase said that he became unfaithful to his wife. In his words, life on the road was lonely and fame wasn't what everybody thought it was. 1992, life on the road caught up to him. His wife, Melanie, called his bluff. She knew all about it. She knew about what he was hiding. He told her later that he wanted to come home and talk about it. And she said, absolutely not. not. This isn't your home anymore. Get out. In that moment, he couldn't run. He couldn't hide. All of his stuff, all of his influence, all of his money couldn't get him out of it. And his immediate response was, Oh, God, help me. Through marriage counseling, his wife forgave him. And through that, DiBiase later would say he became an authentic Christian. God saved that out of, out of, out of just tragic end there. But DiBiase didn't want to live that kind of lifestyle any longer. In 2000, DiBiase had his first opportunity to speak in a church. He became a pastor. He became a preacher. And at the end of, end of the time of his first time that he was sharing, a tall red-headed young guy came up front and started bawling his eyes out. He said, all my life my parents, my grandparents were telling me how much I needed Jesus. But it wasn't until tonight that I understood that myself. Bawling on his shoulder, DiBiase prayed for that young guy and said of that experience, listen, I sat and I realized God is just used me to change kids life, this kid's life. I wrestled in front of 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium, and that's a pretty big thrill, but that didn't touch anything compared to this moment in my life. It wasn't until there was nowhere else he could run, nowhere else that he could hide, but he had to face God face to face. Now surely from a worldly standard, he had everything and anything he could ever want except real fulfillment. That only comes from God's blessing on your life. You can try to grab all you can or you can learn how to receive from God's hand. Two completely different things. God's blessing isn't in what we get from him. It's who we get from him. Namely himself. 
God is the only fulfilling measure in this life. Nothing else satisfies. An abiding relationship, a continued relationship, a walking relationship with Christ is the only thing that fulfills and satisfies the human soul. But it's hard for us to be convinced of it, isn't it, sometimes? <laughs> so we, we make it our aim to, to grab for what we can get. For Jacob, this was the final straw, the final round, his grab versus God's blessing. His will versus God's will. We all question God's will better than the, the, if it's better than our own will for our own lives. We all wrestle with God's will. Wrestling with God's will goes through four stages. The first one is the give me stage. If you have kids, you kind of know this theme. You can have a, a room full of toddlers. One toddler, maybe he's, he's playing with a certain toy. He's loving life. Life is good. He's got his toy and everything is good in his little three-year-old world. Kid across the room sees that he's playing with this toy and sees how much fun he's having. He says, I want to have that kind of fun. It must be that toy that he has. If that's how you have that much fun, I need to get that toy. So that kid walks over the other side of the room, takes the toy from the one kid that's having so much fun, and what happens? Conflict. You know, we as adults are not so much different. Can you say marriage, anybody? Right? How often have you fought with your spouse because of what you wanted rather than what they wanted? It's the give me attitude. If I don't get what I want, then I'm going to make life difficult for you. Problem is, you can't do that with God. He doesn't entertain our temper tantrums. How we question, we throw fits, we give cold shoulders. But God doesn't seem to be moved by that. So then we start questioning God's goodness. We start questioning if we really want to obey God. Like children, we simply want God to just give us everything that we want. That's not what God's up to. Kind of like the prodigal son. He wanted everything that his, his dad had, but not his dad. He told his dad to give him his share of his inheritance, and he was gone, just like that. He tried living his life to satisfy every single pleasure, but came out empty-handed and empty on the inside. James 4, 3 says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. God's not about to give you everything you ask for because it will not only ruin you, but it will also make you believe it's okay to live that way. That's the greater fear. That's the greater issue. Not that it's going to mess you up in, in, in certain ways and get you off track in life, but, but God knows that when we start living that way, we actually think it's okay to live that way. Flashback on Jacob's life, he was the second born after his brother Esau. He had already tricked Esau out of the birthright, but now he was part of a plan to, with his mom to trick Esau out of his father's blessing too. It's time for Isaac to give Esau his blessing, so he sends Esau out to the fields to hunt for game in order for him to cook, cook up old Isaac some good dinner. What do you think he made him? Maybe some steak? Maybe some ribs? Hamburger? I know, we're all getting hungry. Get it. But meanwhile, Jacob, his mom, they're charting their own course. Rebecca made a meal similar to to what Esau would make, and then she helped Jacob just cover him with all this, this wool, this sheep wool on him, because Esau was a hairy man, so they wanted to really sell this, this deceit. I mean, poor guy Esau, I mean, if you have that much hair that it's like sheep wool on you, <laughs> maybe you'd better take it easy on the Rogaine, I don't know, but man, I'm telling you. Regardless of hair growth treatments, Jacob cheated his brother out of his blessing that day because of his give me attitude. Ever been cheated out of something before? Promotion? Relationship? Money? Credit? Blessing? Doesn't feel so good, does it? In fact, it feels like getting even. Esau vowed to end Jacob's life. You might think, for a blessing from his father? It says Esau, Esau was distraught. 
Because he missed out on the blessing from his father. It was more valuable than any possession that his father could ever give him. More precious than money. He was the word of the Lord spoken, which communicates high value and a special future. It was more valuable than anything else. This wasn't from Isaac. It was from the Lord. Isaac couldn't just make another one happen. Jacob grabbed it because of his give me attitude. He wanted what was not rightfully his. He stole his brother's blessing. The way to kill a give me attitude is by the exact opposite. Rather, rather than give me, have a giving attitude. Give when it hurts. Give when it's hard. Give when you have the opportunity. Give when you don't. Jesus Christ was the most giving person on this earth. He was the most generous and the most kind. Killing the give me attitude starts with getting your thoughts off self and giving to others on your own dime, your own time, all to honor the heart of God freely because God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus said there's no greater love than one who gives up his life for his friends. Life isn't all about what we can get. It's not all about ourselves. It's about giving up our lives to love. That's what love looks like. The next stage of wrestling with God's will in our lives is the stage where we tell God, instead of give me, use me. Use me, God. Have you ever told God, use me before? That's a good thing. And it can be a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But it also, it also can be a cover-up. It can be a cover-up for our own self-serving motivations. God, use me. But not in this way or, or that way, in, 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 in the way that I want. God, God, use me not in some foreign land. God, use me not to clean toilets. Really, I, I, want, I want something where I'm noticed. I want something where, where people give me a good job on, on my shoulder. God, use me to be a blessing for other people. But really, I just want praise and attention or promotion or love. or You fill in the blank. I don't know. We say, God, use me, but with conditions, of course. Jacob did this in Genesis 28. He makes a vow to God saying, hey, God, if, you, if you're with me, if you provide for me, if you take care of me, if you do all these things for me, then you'll be my God. You think God was like, oh, that sounds like a great deal. I'll take care of everything for you, and then I get the pleasure of just having you along for the ride. I don't think so. It's the I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine mentality. That's not Christ's mentality. Jesus said Gentiles do that. The world does that. When we boil it down, Jacob's no different than Jesus' disciples when they were fighting about who was the greatest. They, they, they were, the reason they were, they were fighting was because they wanted Jesus to use them to be the greatest. It was for their own purpose. Let me be the greatest, God. I'm doing all this for you, but I want you to make me great. Self-promoting. Kind of the opposite idea God has for you and me. In order for God to overcome that kind of attitude in us, God brings, brings us through the fire. He gives us a taste of some stuff that can either break us or make us, and he begins to burn some of that attitude off of us. For Jacob... That fire was his uncle Laban. He was a dysfunctional uncle. Anybody got one of those? Laban was God's lesson to Jacob of reaping what you sow. Jacob sowed seeds of deceit. And he reaped them with Laban. Laban cheating Jacob several times over. Jacob got a taste of his own medicine. God allows us to go through fire, not because he's mean, but because he wants us to become more like Jesus Christ. And when we follow God for self-serving reasons, we deceive ourselves that we're actually following God at all. Selfishness actually destroys our souls, our relationships, destroys our peace with God, destroys our families. Just as it did with Jacob's family amidst all of the dysfunction. After Pearl Harbor, there was a guy by the name of Bob Feller. He couldn't help but sign up to serve in the military after what was done. 
during the World War II. At the time, he was 23, and he was actually the pitcher for the Cleveland Indians. He was a phenomenon. This young man, he, he had already pitched a no-hitter and won 107 games in the major leagues. That's no small task. Bob was in stride, and he was hitting his prime. Rather than continuing to throw strikeouts, though, he decided fighting for his country was the right thing to do. And so when he returned to baseball after the war, Bob went on to throw three more no-hitters, 12 one-hitters, and win 266 games. Now that's nothing shy of greatness right there. But because he served his country, he lost out on winning another 80 to 100 games. And with that, much of the fame that comes with those accolades. When baseball fans uh, elected the all-century team in 1999, Bob and his 266 victories were ignored in favor of two other pitchers. There are some who believe that Feller is the most underrated baseball player of all time. He was once asked if he regretted going to serve. And his answer was, no, I, I've, I've made many mistakes in my life, but that wasn't one of them. He made a commitment to serve, to give of himself. Not to, be, not to be used just for himself, but to be used to help out keeping our country safe. God's will is not conditional. It can't be bribed. It can't be manipulated. God is in it to win you. And that means he's after those areas that are self-serving and not Christ-honoring. And he's going to go after them. He's going to work those out in that wrestling match until we get to the next stage when we say, help me. <laughs> Whether we want to admit it or not, we all come to places in our lives that we need help. Just before Jacob goes head to head with God in the ring, he finds himself praying again. And rather than attaching conditions to it this time, all he can do is ask God for help. Maybe you've come to that place too. You can't escape the diagnosis that was just told to you. Say, God, help me. You can't figure out how to fix that issue with your kid. God, I need your help. Your marital issues are, aren't getting any better. In fact, they're getting worse. Your heart's hardening. God, help me. We all need help sometime. Where does your help come from? Psalm 121 says, comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. There's no other source. Jacob knew his only option was God. He wasn't going to be able to get it from anyone else. He burned all those bridges. He couldn't buy Esau off. There was no escape. It all caught up to him. You see, it's our pride that keeps us from going straight to God. We go around him, we dodge him. Sometimes we act as if we're really pursuing him, but we're really, all we're doing is, is, is doing what we want for ourselves. Pride keeps us unteachable and unreachable. Pride is, it's, it's the most detrimental sin that there is. Pride can blind your life. You can think that you're being used by God. You can think a lot of things, but man, you can really miss, miss God in, in your life. Jacob came to this round in his life where he realized he couldn't deceive his way out of facing his past. He couldn't run from his past, demons, to this place where God begins to search us and know us, show us what's really in here. He starts to call us out on the carpet for blaming everybody else. He begins to show you how your expectations of others are not really in their interest, they're in your interest. Our own dysfunctions keep us in a place where it's everybody else's fault, it's somebody else's responsibility, it's other people's problems, and you're 100% right and they're 100% wrong. When we ask God for help, he'll help us, but it might start with him showing us what's in here. Looking to God for help is not wimpy, it's wise. 
It's the wisest thing that you can do because without God's help, you're still you in your life. But with God's help, you can be somebody new. The last stage is the place where God breaks you and then blesses you. It's where you finally ask God, mold me. It's the place where you move from what God can do for you to what God can do through you. It's the round where we say what Isaiah said, O Lord, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. We're not the work of our own hands, fashioning ourselves with the work of God's hands. Are you letting him mold your life? Are you letting him mold your mindsets? Are you letting him mold your character? Are you letting him mold your future? Or you have your hands on that thing? In any given moment, God could have ended Jacob right then and there, but he didn't. It's called grace. And so God gave him something to remember him by forever. A limp. Who would have ever known that a limp was God's grace? It was a daily reminder that you can't outpace God, Jacob. You can't outmaneuver God, Jacob. You can't run from God, Jacob. You can't outsmart God, but you can walk with him. If we're not willing to stop striving and grabbing, God in his love for us will break us in order to bless us. Jacob finally came to the end of himself in the moment with God. In fact, he pulled a reversal. A reversal is when the person who is kind of getting pinned in a defensive position in wrestling makes a move where they regain control over their opponent. And Jacob did that of sorts, but it looked a lot different. Hosea 12 gives us a little bit more of a picture of this. It says, Jacob wept and he sought God's favor. Instead of Jacob the supplanter, the grabber, the deceiver, Jacob didn't do what he had always done all the times before. He did a reversal. He humbled himself before God and sought God from a different position. A position where he didn't try to be God's equal. A position where he became moldable. He allowed God to make him instead of being a self-made man. And the question that I have for you in this season of your life, are you pliable, moldable? This man who is most certainly Christ asked Jacob in this moment, what is your name? Now, God already knew Jacob's name. He, he knew him. But there's always a bigger lesson when God is asking us questions. See, the last time Jacob was asked his name, you know when it was? It was when he was standing before his father, Father Isaac, blind, aged, old. Isaac couldn't tell who was standing in front of him. He was ready for the blessing to give it to his oldest son, Esau. He didn't know who was standing in front. He said, hey, who, 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 who are you? Jacob deceivingly said, I'm Esau. That was the last time somebody asked J Jacob his name. Just imagine in that moment, all the regret, all the shame, all the stuff that's just, just pouring in in that moment. Talk about a flashback. Regret. Of stealing something that was not his. But in this moment when he's weeping and crying out to God, he's broken. And in that place, it's where God gives him a new name, Israel. He said, because you struggle with God and with man, you've overcome. This is your new name. This is your new identity. You are no longer Jacob. Self. You're now Israel. And from you, a nation is going to come. And out of this nation... My son, the Messiah, will be born. And from this nation, all the world will be blessed. Because I'm sending my son who will be without deceit. 
in his heart. He will be filled with truth and righteousness. And he will be that sacrifice by giving himself up on the cross. He will do it all different than everybody and anybody before us. Jacob in that moment realized he could not outmaneuver God. He just had to receive him. And the greatest blessing that Jacob received that day wasn't his limp, wasn't the, the blessing that, that God spoke over him, it was God himself. He met with God himself. I don't know what season you're at in your life. But in order to meet with God, you've got to be pliable. You've got to be moldable. You've got to allow him to break some things within you so that he can remake some things in your life. It's okay to do that. You've got to trust him that his goodness will lead you through that. And it'll teach you what it is to have a new identity in Christ. Can we stand to our feet right now and pray together? Jesus, we know that there is a blessing in the wrestling. All of us wrestle with your will in our lives. I don't know what stage each and every person are at in their lives, you do. Whether at the give me stage, the use me stage, help me or mold me stage, I, I don't know. But Lord, I am confident that you're speaking to your bride in our hearts right now. And so God, for that area or those areas or whatever areas that might need some breaking right now, so there can be some reshaping and some remolding. Lord, I pray your grace to meet us in this place this, this day. God, it says that it's in our weakness your power is made perfect. God, we try to run from our weakness. We try to run from our stuff. We try to outmaneuver that. We try to cover it over. But God, you say, no, in your weakness, I'll perfect my power. Because it's through that that you're going to be made whole. It's through that that you're going to win. And you're going to walk out of the wrestling ring with me, walking in my will. Father God, I pray this day your will be done in our lives. We offer them up to you, Jesus. And God, I would just ask, Lord Jesus, that as, as we wrestle with your will in our lives, God, that you would help us to walk through, to walk with you, to receive the blessing of God instead of striving for it in our lives. God, I ask your peace upon each person here today. I pray, I pray that you... God, I ask that you... We give you our hearts, Lord. You're the potter and we're the clay. Mold us, mold our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, right now we are going to go into a time of worship. We're also going to go into a time of ministry. If you need prayer for anything, I want to encourage you right now to invite the presence of God. Invite the Word of God in your life in that way as we pray for you. We'll have prayer up here at the altar. We want to pray with you. We want to stand with you. We want to believe with you. We want to bless you today in this place. The altar is open if you need that. Feel free to worship with us now in this moment. If you have to go, God bless you. Know that you're loved. Go in God's blessing. Go knowing that, hey, your brokenness he can make some stuff out of. He can reshape. He can remold. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We love you. Let's pursue Christ right now.